All right, so again, welcome if you're new. We're in a series that we started last week that we've titled Foundations. And, and the, the hope or the goal or the aim of this series uh, is for the people of God to be anchored in a few truths, a few essential truths that really uh, throughout the generations have carried the church through uh, all sorts of uh, confusion and uncertainty, especially like the, 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 the age we find ourselves in now. And so we talked about this last week. We started with the question, what is God? And for about 2,000 years, Christians have relied upon catechism or a way of training and answering those questions to solidify what we mean when we talk about God. Because if we can't center our hearts, our minds, and even the very orientation of our lives around the person of God, God, then we're just sort of, uh, we're like a, an untethered boat at sea in the midst of a storm. We'll be blown wherever the wind will take us. And in this day and age where we find ourselves asking really kind of crazy questions about fundamental things about humanity and the nature of, of reality itself, we need to know that we are created and he is creator. There is creator and creation, as we talked about last week, that God is glorious and he's worthy of our worship and he's greater than all things. And that bleeds over today into what the second question that we have, which is, what is a person? We talked about this last week when we looked a little bit at, at Romans chapter 1. Human beings only have their bearings in relationship to the one who created them. But then once we know God, if, instead of suppressing that truth and unrighteousness, we got to find our personhood, our, our, the very nature of our identity in the person of God as well. And so we see that today going all the way back to, to Genesis chapter 1, to the creation story where God has created all things and he's set things into order. He's taken chaos and made order out of it. And at the crowning uh, epic of, of this particular narrative, at the, the, the crescendo of the creation event, God creates man and woman and he makes mankind, as we'll see in just a second, in his image. Look in verse 26 of Genesis 1 with me this morning. Then God said... Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. So today at, at 3 p.m. will mark a kind of a significant moment in the life of our church for the Best I can re remember, for the first time ever, we'll lay to rest one of our former elders. So last Sunday, Ron Favalaro died, right, as we were finishing up our second service. And, uh, and so we'll be having his funeral today at 3 o'clock here. And it's set me, my mind, my heart in a particular direction this week, especially as it pertains to, to the question of what is a person. But, because Ron, um, Ron embodied in many ways what I think it means to live out the hope of the gospel. Ron served our church as a, as a small group leader. He served our church as a deacon. He served our church as an, as an elder. And maybe more than any other grown man I've ever met, Ron told me he loved me over and over and over again. In fact, I'll say it in, a sermon, in my funeral sermon today. I think he told me he loved me more than my mom has. That's, that's a true statement. Like, love you, mom. But Ron never broke off a conversation without telling me that he loved me. And, and so as I've been thinking about this this week, Ron's death and honoring his life and grieving his loss, but also asking this question, what is a person? And coming back to this foundational passage in Genesis chapter one, that human beings are made in the image of God. I've just been struck by this idea that, that personhood, um, living into the fullness of, of, of what it means to be shaped and formed by the person of Jesus Christ and having a life, although Ron's life wasn't perfect, you know, he was, he's a dude just like me or you, but having a life that for the most part is marked and shaped and directed by the beauty of who God is and the truth of God's word, that is a beautiful thing. And personhood fully experienced and fully lived out. That's, that's the aim and the hope and the desire of, of everyone in this moment breathing oxygen. You know, they, all of us who have blood in our, in our, in our veins and, and, and oxygen in our lungs. Right now, the hope is that our life would matter and it would account for something. And it would, it would be something that could be beheld by others as, as beautiful and good and right and true and righteous. 
So as I thought about Ron's life and I thought about that, I thought, man, this is what an important question for us to wrestle with today. What, what is a person? What did God mean? What did God intend when he formed and crafted human beings made in his image? What does that statement mean and how is that best expressed and lived out. So I just want to do a few things today with this passage. I want to answer a few questions about, uh, or or point to a few truths about how we answer that question. What is a person? What does God intend when he made humanity? The first thing we see, and it needs quite a bit of unpacking, we see it back in verse 26 when God says, let us make man in our image. We are, as human beings, made in the image of God. What does it mean to be a person? It means to be made in the image of God. Now, what does that mean? That's the big question. Uh, a litany of books have been published. There has been ink spilled for a couple thousand years trying to answer that question. And best I can tell you, you can answer that question. The most faithful way, I think, to answer that question is one of two ways. Uh, and maybe some combination of both. The first is, what does that image of God's statement mean? Well, what did it mean in the original context, in the original uh, time and space when these words were written? The, the ancient Near East, all right? So you go look at ancient Near Eastern literature, ancient Near Eastern kingdoms and nation states, and what was, what was being said when authors or writers would say the image of God? In the ancient Near East, it was common practice, whether it be uh, the, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the, uh, the, 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 the Israelites, whomever, image of God typically meant that whenever a king or an emperor would ascend to some power, he would outline the boundaries or the, the, the territory that he was governing over with statues of himself that would bear his image so that if you were a sojourner or a foreigner who wound up in this kingdom, you could look at that image and know who was in charge. It's why almost always money in the ancient world was marked with the image of whoever the king, emperor, or ruler was. Because it was believed that if I'm exchanging currency in this kingdom, it's showing me who is in charge of all the things. And so if you take that idea and you take that, that concept that in the ancient Near East, the image of God was something resembling the one who was in charge, something to show forth some measure of understanding of who is ruling this place in this time. Then whenever the author of, uh, of Genesis, be it Moses perhaps, says that we are made in the image of God, he's saying that human beings are stamped with God's image in such a way so as that we are called to show forth God's character and God's nature and God's uh, differentiating nature from the things of creation into the world. We are called to reflect God. We talked about this a little bit last week in Genesis or in Romans chapter one, when Paul is talking about uh, what goes wrong in human beings. It's that we, we see the, the, the power of God. We see God's uh, character and nature on display in creation, but we suppress that truth in unrighteousness. And we begin to exchange the truth of God for a lie. And when we do that, we, we no longer show forth that character and that nature into the world. We try to become our own gods. And that always always begins to cause uh, society to dissolve into nothingness. It it causes uh, fragmentation in relationships. It it causes things, chaos to erupt. And so when the author here is saying that we're made in the image of God, God said, "Let, let us make them in our image. He's saying that the intention of God from the beginning was that humanity would mirror God out into the world. And the other way to interpret this, and I think this is also true, is to take the context. What, what does the rest of this chapter of Genesis or the first 11 chapters of, of Genesis talk about the image of God? And what I think we begin to see, especially even here with Adam and Eve, is that whenever this, this, this characteristic is given to Adam and Eve, what, what it means is that they're differentiated from the rest of creation. In fact, if we had time this morning, we would go into Genesis 2 and you would see that God sets Adam on a mission to name all the animals, and, and it's not good that man is alone. So Adam is sent on this mission by God to name all the animals. And when it comes back, he says that he was not able to find in creation something that was fit for himself. In other words, part of his, his, his responsibility was to come to an acknowledgement or come to an understanding that he's shaped by God and therefore there's nothing else like him in all of creation. So I think if you take those two truths, those two twin ideas of what it means to be made in the image of God, that we're supposed to reflect God's character and that we're different than virtually everything else in in all of creation, I think there are two things that we need to understand this morning if we're going to understand what it means to be a person. The first one is simply this. If we're made in the image of God, then we all possess dignity. We all possess 
dignity. Every human being, every living person has in themselves some measure, being made in the image of God, they have some measure of, of, of dignity. That is, they're, they're worthy of honor, they're worthy of respect because they are stamped by the very nature of God himself in his likeness. All humans then are worthy of some measure of honor and of respect. It means that we are different than the rest of creation. It means that though we're not supposed to worship one another, there is something about humanity that's different than the animals. It's it's different than the trees. It's different than the plants. It's different than the planets. There's something about us that is godlike. One of my favorite things I've ever read written on this idea comes from C.S. Lewis in his classic book, The Weight of Glory. And he talks about the, the differentiating factor that is being made in the image of God. He says it like this, There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations and cultures and arts and civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals with whom with we joke, who we work with, we marry, we snub, and we exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This, is, this does not mean that we are to be particularly solemn. We must play, but our merriment must be of that kind and is, in fact, the merriest kind, which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. Lewis says, look, when you interact with another human being, you are interacting with someone who is made in the image of God, and they need to be taken very seriously. There's no minimization of other human beings. There's no superiority or or, or pecking order given to human beings. That we are made in God's image, therefore we have weight. We have have dignity. We have that which is worthy of respect. It's what Francis Schaeffer said, in God's kingdom, there is no such thing as little people. We all carry within all of us this measure of God-like stamp. We are made in the image of God. You have dignity. And so does your neighbor independent of their views of the world, independent of whatever leanings they may have in one direction or another, your neighbor has dignity as well. More on that in just a second. But not only that, if we're made in the image of God and if we're given this responsibility, like Adam is to name the animals, if we're given dominion, as the author here says in, 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 in verse 26 and 27, if God says, be, be fruitful and multiply, rule the earth and subdue it, Care for and cultivate the planet in such a way as where it brings forth the fruit that God intended. Then there's something about being made in the image of God that means that we all possess agency. We all possess agency. What do I mean by that? We have these godlike sensibilities, and what comes with that then is responsibility. God has given us this, uh, this innate divine nature, this thing flowing within us that we can enact in creation what God intended and it will bring forth the fruit that God, God purposed. But with that comes a very serious responsibility. The implication is, is that if you or I have dominion, we have to uphold that God's intention in, in the, the, the order that he gave us, the rule that he gave us. The implication of dominion is that we have a responsibility to uphold the inherent dignity and glory in other human beings, which means that any time we are downplaying the significance of another person, we're, we're, we're presenting an affront to what it means that they are made in the image of God as well. It's why that for Christians, for the past couple thousand years, the idea of individual rights, freedom, ideas like democracy, do you realize that that's grounded in this idea that We all have dignity and we all have agency. And then you can't really come to that conclusion with a purely secular view of the world. So I'm kind of getting some blank stares. Let me dial down on this real quick, okay? If if you adopt a secular worldview, if you adopt a a worldview that says you can all talk of religion, all talk of a God, doesn't doesn't have any place in in, in the private, in the public sector, public square at all. Okay, that's fine. And if you adopt an evolutionary presupposition about how the world works and operates, okay, that the, it's survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, the strong eat the weak, okay, you cannot have a purely secular view of how the world came into being, about creation, about any of these things. You can't hold on to that and believe in individual rights, right? They're contradictory. If you believe that the strong eat the weak, then the weak, they don't deserve rights. They shouldn't have rights. 
They're, they're at the disposal of the strong. They're to be subjugated by the, the strong can do with one, them what they please. They don't have rights. This is the way evolution works. But if you believe in a creation story where there is a God who is distinct from the creation, who is creator, and has set into motion that there are beings that are made in his image who have an inherent dignity about them and an agency to steward that the power and the honor that they have, then, then all sorts of beautiful things become possible for the human species. One of my favorite things I've ever read on this comes from uh, Tim Keller, a preacher. He preached on this subject way back when, and he talked about how Christians who have believed were made in the image of God, how that has affected basically the course of world history. He says, the earliest Christians were champions of women. They were champions of orphans. They were champions of the weak. They were champions of the poor. They were against abortion. They put the rest of the culture to shame because of their belief in the sanctity of life. So eventually, the entire Western world adopted the idea of the image of God. If you believe in individual rights, if if you believe in freedom, if you believe in democracy, all of it ties back to this idea that we have dignity and we have agency because we're made in the image of God. And you can't have one without the other. They go together. Now, two implications, and I'll move on. The first one is simply this. Look, this morning, if, and I got to bring this up because this is, this is my default. This is, um, if, if I have a besetting, particularly besetting problem in my way of thinking, it's, um, I think, clinical diagnosis is called self-loathing, but a, a tendency to, to consider my life of little value or of little worth. If you walk in today and that's the, kind of your default operating position, let me say to you what I need to hear myself this morning. You are not trash. You are not worthless. Your life matters. You are made in the image of God. So set up in your chair, take in a deep breath, puff up your chest a little bit this morning. You have dignity. You have worth. Your life matters. I and mean, part of the thing is, I, I'll talk about my friend Ron today when we lay him to rest. Part of the thing about his life that was so beautiful is that he, he used his life in such a way as to show that all people had dignity. And in doing so, it made him such a dignified human. Time in hospitals, time in, in prisons, time spent with people who would probably be brushed aside to the margins. That, there may be nothing more dignifying than that. And so today, if you walked in, you limped in here thinking, man, I don't really know what my life is worth. I don't know what it matters. God has stamped you with his image. You have blood in your veins and oxygen in your lungs today, and your life matters. Second, If this is true, that all human beings have dignity, all human beings possess agency, then any and all forms of classism, of racism, of of nationalism, any and all forms that puts people on a hierarchy where some people are superior superior to others, that is an actual affront to the God of the universe. It is is shaking your fist at the creator saying, no, I'm made in the image of God, but those people, however you categorize them, are not worthy of the respect, the honor, and the dignity that all people deserve. See, this is why for Christians, any hint of superiority from one image bearer to another is unthinkable. It's unconscionable. Whether that image bearer is of a different race or ethnicity, whether that image image bearer is from a different class than you, they're richer, they're poor, whether that image bearer is unborn or old, all of our ethics surrounding how we treat humans spawn from this idea that we all have dignity because we're all made in the image of God. And anything in our hearts or souls that, that is averse to that needs to be brought under the light of, of the truth of God's word and brought to repentance, not coddled and festered in our hearts to where we feel like there's some way that we should be superior to other people and God should sanction that. It just simply isn't true. Second, We are made, at least the author of Genesis here says, and it's quite explicit, we are made male and female. This is really important because when God sets the creation story into motion, and when he goes through, he makes the day and the night, he makes uh, the oceans, he makes all the things. And then at the crowning achievement of that, in verse 26, he makes human beings in his image. Look at how it's worded. This is important. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let, here it is, them have dominion. Them. So there's, it's a plural. There's something about what God's going to do next in making human beings that is the image of God collectively. Let, let us make them, let them have dominion. So in verse 27, so God created man in his own, own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What does that mean? 
I think that in the design of God, the image of God being shown forth in the creation, that, that man and woman were meant to complement or, or to yeah, complement one another and to complete the image of God. What, am, what do I mean by that? They're made to complement. So there's something that Adam and Eve do together that is complementary in the nature of their relationship. We see this at the end of Genesis 2 whenever Adam looks upon Eve and says, at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. At last, there's, some, there's something about her that I don't possess. There's something about, about me that she doesn't possess. And together, there's this complementary thing. And this isn't talking about hierarchy. It's talking about completeness or wholeness. That's why you know, Jerry Maguire had it wrong. You, you do not complete me. But together, male and female, in harmony together, in acting what God had created them for and originally intended them for, shows forth the image of God. Be fruitful and multiply. I don't want to be crass because there are kids in the room. What do you think that means? There's something about the nature of their design in their sex and in their sexuality that bears forth personhood. They're both distinct and yet they're similar. They're designed to complement, they're designed to complete. So one of my favorite books on Genesis 1 through 11 is written by this philosopher and theologian named Drew Johnson. It's called The Universal Story. And he's thought about the implications of all these things and kind of walked them out. And I love the way that, the way that he writes about this particular issue and what he says that it means whenever God is making man and woman in, in, in his image and that they're, they're, they're intended to be for, show forth the image of God. He says this, because the creation account portrays sexuality as it was intended, the biblical authors seem to presume it as the cornerstone to future instruction on sexual ethics, marriage, and family. Many readers are then surprised to find out that the Old Testament does not contain a simple instruction on the matter of who can marry whom and how. So real quick, what's he saying? Johnson says, look, um, because the author of Scripture, because God and his intention in authoring and penning Scripture put in the very beginning stages of the creation story that God created the male and female, then it's sort of assumed then that God doesn't have to spell out all the details from that, that point forward. It's kind of assumed that this is the way human beings interact and intersect with one another in order to be fruitful and multiply. So here's the way I, I liken it. Okay, I'm a parent. Some of my kids are in the room. I've got to be careful here. I'm a parent. And you learn at some point in parenting that a kid will do something in the home and then they'll come to you and say what they did and you'll say, why did you do that? And say, well, you didn't tell me I couldn't. And you're like, I didn't think I had to. I didn't think I had to make the rule that said firecrackers and knives and you know, sliding down the banister is a bad idea. Like, I didn't think that I had to come up with that rule or I would have put it in there, but here we are, I guess. I got to come up with the rule. So, so often what happens on questions about sexuality and gender and identity and all these things is that we come back to the scripture and you'll hear things like this. It's common today. I heard it just recently. But Jesus didn't say anything about X pertaining to Y. I'm like, yeah, he didn't. He didn't say anything about black tar heroin. I don't think that we should go out and shoot it into our veins. There's a whole load of things he didn't say anything about. There's, there's a trajectory, though, in the way the ethics work. Jesus didn't say anything about the dangers of internet pornography because the internet didn't exist, but he did talk about lust. And he didn't say anything about human relationships and the dynamic, the way that we're trying to talk about them in our day and age, which has just gone completely off the rails, but he did, he did assume some things. Right? Jesus never said, you know, the book of Leviticus gets very specific about male-male relationship, female-female relationships. It gets very specific about gender and those things. But here's where I differentiate and disagree with it. He never did that. He just assumed it as a good Jewish boy that believed the Torah. This is the way this thing works. And so when it comes to the scriptures, when it comes to the ideas of sex and sexuality, that, that's what's happening here in Genesis 1. He made them male and female. This is assumed as the way that this thing is etched into the fabric of being. In fact, Johnson goes on. He says this. However, the scripture doesn't get into the particulars of this, but, but scripture not only argues for a particular view of marriage, but does so in the strongest terms available through the creation story. I do not need to tell the reader that our, our theology of sexuality and our ability to articulate it is a current and pressing issue, sloppily flung around in popular media outlets today. This means that we cannot actually understand the sexual and marital teaching of Leviticus or Matthew or Paul apart from a firm grasp on what Genesis 1, 1 through 11 is doing with sexu sexuality as scripture. In other words... You can't make sense of any other teaching in the Bible on sex and scripture and, and, and marriage and scripture without understanding what, what is being said here. God made them male and female, and in being male and female, they reflect forward the image of God. 
Two implications, and I'll move off this point, but it's got to be said because this is really important in our day and age. The first one is today if you hear all this and you think, man, I've been trying to dodge this sort of like rigid fundamentalism about sex and sexuality for a long time, and this frustrates me. Okay, just give me a chance. Okay, listen to me for just a second. Suspend any God talk that I'm having right now, and let's talk about simply biology and physiology for a second. And, and I think we can come to some common ground of agreeing just for a second that 20 years ago, there were things written in your biology textbook that would today be coined as hate speech, right? And so let's not call the Bible bigoted or antiquated whenever our biology textbooks from maybe even so recent as five or six years ago is now being called. A man cannot be born with a uterus. That's not hateful. It's, it's the last you know, 400 years of the Enlightenment scientific method, method where we've been able to say, you know what, this is, we've cut people open. There's never been one of those in one of these. <laughs> and so just at the level of physiology and biology, we can have a conversation. This isn't a serious conversation if we get to jettison human history for 4,000 years. It just isn't. And if it's going to be a serious conversation, then gender and sex debates, they, they require, if they require us to suspend not just truth that we've come to know as a human species, but faith as well. It's just not a serious conversation. Now, here's where this gets really important and interesting for Christians, though. We haven't talked about male and female first. We talked about made in the image of God first. All human beings have dignity, even those who disagree with me about what I would say this says about male and female. So the tension point for believers in our day and age where we are fastening ourselves to particular anchors of truth so that we can withstand the storm of wild craziness that's going on around us, it happens that we have to be people of conviction and people of compassion. Where it's not compassionate to agree with someone to suppress the truth of God and unrighteousness and begin worshiping and serving created things rather than creator God. That's not compassionate. We have to hold on to the conviction. We are created. God has set this thing into motion. We come under his rule and under his authority. But it is compassionate to say, man, you may be struggling with this, that, or the other, and I love you. You are my neighbor. You have dignity. You are a human person with agency, and I will be, I will be with you in love and grace because that's what God has done for me in Jesus. The word became flesh. The word became a person and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Not one or the other, both. Which is why this last point's really important. We were made for community. It's, it's significant that God says, let us make man in our image. God has existed, Father, Son, and Spirit, in this triune community before the beginning of all things. And then when he births into being humanity, he does so in the plural, male and female. And then we see from the crescendo of this, from the way that this entire narrative builds up to, to this elevated moment at the very end of Genesis chapter 2, where male and female are together. Adam is singing a song because he finally laid eyes on Eve. And he says, at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And the whole narrative comes to a conclusion with this. And they were naked and unashamed. That's what we were built for, y'all, to be, to be fully known and to be fully loved. What is a person? A person is someone who aches for that experience. We all want to get back to Eden. We all want to be exposed in the core of who we are and known in who we are, and yet at the same time loved by, by God and by one another. We have a desire to be known. We have a desire to be loved. And we will be aimlessly searching about this creation, turning over every rock, worshiping every small thing we can lay eyes on until we find this experience in the person of Jesus. The Catholics have done great thought on this. In their catechism, they say this about what it means to be a human person. Being in the image of God, the human individual possesses the dignity of a person who is not just something but someone he is capable of self-knowledge and of self-possession and of freely giving himself and entertaining, entering into communion with other persons. And he is called by grace to a covenant with his creator to offer him a response of faith and love that no other creature can give in his stead. You are made to know God. You're made to be known by others. You're made to be loved by God. You're made to show love to others. And until we find that sort of community, our personhood will be aimlessly wrestling with all, any and all sorts of things that will offer to us some little trinket of what it feels like to be known and loved. And if that's you today, if you came in with that ache in your bones, with that kind of pit in your soul, then I have good news for you. The person of Jesus took on flesh. Jesus became a person for us. 
so that we could know that on the cross, everything that could ever be known about us was known, and yet Jesus would still go in our stead and die in our place for our sins, so that he could say, it is finished. And the, 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 the road towards reconciliation with God and with one another would be paved by, by Jesus himself in his person. And the fullness of what it means to be human can only be experienced in faith and through faith in him. That's it. That's the only hope we got, to be known and be loved. Father, this morning, would our full humanity be on display as we turn to Christ in faith? As we let go of all the small ways that we've attempted to be our own God, of all the ways that we've attempted to, to find superiority over others, and to to lessen the dignity of others so that we could beef up our own ego, our own hubris. God, through faith and repentance, would we find in Jesus the beauty of what it means to be human and then extend it not just to one another, but to the world, that we would be your image bearer so that the world can see you as good, kind, true, and beautiful because that's what you've been to us. In Jesus' name, amen.